Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Since my latest book is called The Case Against Sugar, the first thing you have to know is that I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nutritionist, I don't have a PhD. Um, I am a journalist. I started my career as an investigative science journalist. Uh, I did my first two books about um, uh, physicists and nuclear physicists who discovered uh, non-existent phenomena and lived to uh, regret it. <clears throat> as such, I was obsessed with um, how hard it is to do science right and uh, how hard it is to get the right answer. And one line I quote in three of my books is from the uh, physicist, Nobel laureate physicist Richard Feynman who said the first principle of science is you must not fool yourself and you're the easiest person to fool. And in the early 90s, after my first two books, I had a lot of fans in the physics community, so they um, said to me, if you're interested in bad science or people who do it wrong, you should look at some of this stuff in public health because it's terrible. So I moved into public health reporting in the early 90s, and I found that my physicist friends had, uh, if anything, underestimated the problem. And by the late 90s, I was moving into nutrition almost purely by chance. I stumbled into the nutrition field, and I did a series of uh, two investigations, one for the journal Science on salt and high blood pressure, and you know, this idea that low salt, that salt causes our blood pressure to go up and hypertension. I spent nine months on a single magazine article. I interviewed over 80 subjects. And I concluded that the evidence behind this idea that salt causes high blood pressure is terrible. And you would only really believe it if your preconception was so strong that you were convinced it was true before any of the studies were done. While I was doing that story, one of the worst scientists I'd ever had the pleasure to interview <laughs> took credit not just for getting Americans to eat less salt, but to eat less fat. And one of my lessons from my early research was that bad scientists never get the right answer. So when I got off the phone with this guy, I called up my editor at Science. I said, when I'm done doing the salt story, I'm going to do a fat story. I, don't, I have no idea what the story is. I was eating a low-fat diet like everyone else in America. But I know that if this guy was involved in any substantive way, there's a great story there. <laughs> um, <clears throat> So I spent a year working on a single magazine article for science, a single investigative piece. It was called The Soft Science of Fat. Um, <clears throat> I interviewed about 140 subjects for one magazine article, and I concluded the evidence behind the low-fat dogma was as bad as it was for the low-salt dogma, and that nutritionists didn't have a clue what they were doing. This was followed about a year later with an infamous cover story for the New York Times Magazine called What If Fat Doesn't Make You Fat, in which I started looking at the science behind obesity and what makes us accumulate excess fat. Um, that piece was probably the most controversial magazine article the New York Times ever ran. Um, one thing such articles do, the cover, you guys might remember this even on the other coast, the cover was a porterhouse steak with a piece of butter on it. Um, and the implication was that Robert Atkins, you know, Dr. Atkins' diet revolution was right all along, okay, which was completely unacceptable to the medical community, but what the evidence seemed to support. So I'll cover stories like that tend to get authors large book advances, which this one did, and it paid for four years of my life so I could then do the book I'd always wanted to do about nutrition science. The book, of course, took five years, so it paid for four. Um, it's an interesting thing in writing. You, you do research till you run out of money. And then you start borrowing and you start writing so you can hand in the manuscript so they could give you some money. And then by the time you hand in the manuscript, the money you get pays back the money you've borrowed and now you're broke again. And no matter how much the advance is, that... Anyway, digressing. Uh, the book that came out of this was Good Calories, Bad Calories. When I went into this field, I thought I was going to sort of let the food police have it for telling us all this, giving us all this bad advice about what makes us sick and make us eat these horribly boring, low-fat, low-salt diets. And in the midst of doing more research on the subject than any human being had done until that time, I realized that there was a very compelling alternative hypothesis. <clears throat> 
which is the problem isn't the fat in the diet, it's the carbohydrates. So the grains and the starches and the sugars. And suddenly I'm writing books in which I am even more of the food police than the other food police, and now I can't go out to eat with anyone in my life without... <laughs> like, we're at a restaurant and they want to order french fries, and they're looking at me like, do you mind? <laughs> um, sad. So my, I wrote this book, Good Calories, Bad Calories. It's 500 pages. It's got 160 pages of endnotes and bibliography. Um, dense read. And after I wrote it, I got emails and letters from people saying, this book changed my life. Could you please write one that's readable? <laughs> like, could you write one that my father could read or my son could read? I got emails from doctors saying, could you write one that my patients could read? And I got emails from patients saying, could you write one that my doctors could read? <laughs> so the result was in 2011, I published a book called What If It's All Been a Big... F uh, excuse me, uh, Why Do We Get Fat? And What to Do About It. If it, I had my say, it would have just been, why do we get fat? Because I don't like to give diet advice. But my editors insisted that if they were going to publish this book, I had to give some advice. Um, I knew the book had succeeded when I got an email from a family friend saying, I was on a flight to the Caribbean, and I read your book, therefore making it airplane reading, and then he said, I haven't had a carbohydrate in three months, I've lost 30 pounds, my blood pressure has dropped, I've never felt so healthy. The problem is I'm blaming obesity and heart disease and the chronic disease that associate with it on sugar and refined grains. And people would say to me, well, what about Southeast Asia? Here's a continent of billions of people who consume a lot of refined grains and don't have high levels of obesity and diabetes. So I'm, the obvious answer to that is this is a population that doesn't eat a lot of sugar. In fact, even though the sugar refining was kind of pioneered in China 2,000 years ago, in part because of the communist era, they never modernized their sugar refining processes, so by the middle of the 20th, late 20th century, they were consuming the amount of sugar we were consuming 200 years earlier. In Japan, which was always raised as an example, even back in the 1920s, when there were public health authorities arguing that sugar caused diabetes, a counter-argument from Elliot Jocelyn, who was a leading diabetes clinician in America, was that, well, the Japanese eat a high-carb diet, and they have very little of the diabetes. Jocelyn didn't realize that sugar and other carbohydrates were different. So the Japanese, as I learned in my research, in the 1960s consumed about as much sugar as we did in the 1860s. And they had the diabetes rates that were similar to what ours were in the 1860s. And along the way in this research, I had done some more articles for the journal Science about the mechanism of a condition called insulin resistance. And insulin resistance is when your cells of your body become resistant to the hormone insulin. It's the fundamental defect in type 2 diabetes, which is a common form that associates with obesity. And insulin resistance is believed by the researchers who study it to actually begin in the liver, in part with fat accumulation, in the liver. And it associates with what's now called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which is also epidemic in America, just like diabetes is. And as it turns out, a sugar molecule, or high fructose corn syrup, is half a molecule of glucose and half a molecule of fructose. It's the fructose that makes it sweet. Fructose is fruit sugar. It's what makes fruit sweet. But in fruit, you get it in very low doses. And when we refine sugar cane or sugar beets or corn into high fructose corn syrup, we basically take out everything but the glucose and the fructose, and then when we put it in sugary beverages, we make it very easy to consume. And the idea is you, this fructose gets dumped on your liver, and it gets, a lot of it gets converted to fat. And if it gets converted to fat, it's going to cause insulin resistance. So you basically have this scenario that I describe in the book where sugar, there's a mechanism by which you would expect it to cause insulin resistance. And you would expect it, if it causes insulin resistance, to cause diabetes and obesity. 
And if it causes diabetes and obesity, you would expect it to at least increase the risk of all these chronic diseases that are associated with obesity and diabetes. So there's this whole cluster of chronic diseases. They're often referred to as diseases of Western life or diseases of uh, Western lifestyles. Heart disease, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, cancer, Alzheimer's, gout, arthritis, half a dozen others, cavities. Okay, cavities are crucial, dental caries, because back in the 1960s, people were saying, since all these diseases cluster together, and the first signs, if you take a native population eating its traditional diet, and you give it a Western diet, on the way to becoming obese and diabetes, the diabetic, the first thing you'll see is cavities occurring in the children. So doesn't it make sense that whatever it is that causes the cavities also causes the obesity and diabetes? Sort of Occam's razor, simplest possible hypotheses. And we know what's causing the cavities. It's sugar and white flour. So what I wanted to do with this book is just lay out this train of sort of possible cause and effect and we have this conventional thinking in the field that the worst that can be said about sugar is it's empty calories. So it's absent vitamins and minerals, and it just adds calories to the diet. So when you consume sugary beverages, maybe you consume it over and above what you need from the rest of the diet, and that's what makes you fat. And to me, that's an excruciating, like, naive way to look at some extraordinarily complex physiological phenomena. So I wanted to lay this out in the book. And that's what I'm doing. So all my books, including my first two on physics and nuclear physics, were about good science and bad science. And one of the things I learned doing this book, or my first book on nutrition, is that prior to World War II, the very best scientific research in the world was done in Europe. Science was, in effect, a European invention. And medical science, all the fields of medical science that relate to obesity and diabetes were pioneered in Europe and in Germany and Austria. Genetics, metabolism, nutrition, endocrinology, the science of hormones and hormone-related diseases. And I, what I learned was that the German and Austrian researchers had a very different hypothesis of obesity than we do. Okay, so we think that obesity is caused by taking in more calories and we, you expend, right? This idea, it's energy imbalance. The counter-argument, the Germans and Austrians had come to the conclusion that obesity is a hormonal defect. You know, back in the 1920s, obese people would say, well, it's hormones, and it was considered an excuse, even back in the 1920s, before any hormone but insulin had been discovered. And people had no idea how hormones work in the human body. The medical community would say, well, this is an excuse for fat people to not eat in moderation like lean people do. And this idea built up through the 1960s that it was hammered on over and over again. And, you know, it can't be a hormonal defect. Fat people just don't have willpower like I do, is the implication. The Germans and Austrians said, clearly it's a hormonal defect. It's got to be a hormonal defect. I mean, look at it. Men and women fat differently. That tells you that sex hormones are involved. Right? It's got to be. Men and women go through puberty, the boys lose fat, the girls gain fat, there's sex hormones, you know, it's... You get these localized accumulations of obesity. The most, one of the most famous is something called steatopigia, which is a big fat, you know, uh, I don't know how, forget that. I don't know how to describe that politically. <laughs> anyway. World War II comes along, the German and Austrian schools vanish. They evaporate. Um, some of these researchers flee to the United States, and, but they don't get jobs because nobody wants to hire these German-Jewish researchers, and certainly not in Ivy League institutions, which actually had protocols in place, so as not to be overrun by Jewish academicians and Jewish students. So, in fact, a lot of them ended up just moving west, and it's one of the reasons places like Washington and, and Berkeley, where I live, are such great universities, because they embrace these people. But this idea that obesity was a hormonal regulatory defect evaporated with the Second World War, and after the war, um, very well-meaning U.S. nutritionists and young doctors sort of recreated the science of obesity from scratch with no idea how to do science and no understanding of endocrinology or genetics or metabolism or even profoundly nutrition, and they ended up with this idea that it's just about eating too much. <laughs>
gluttony and sloth. It was like a biblical theory of obesity. And in the 1960s, when researchers started to understand what it is that actually regulates the accumulation of fat in your fat cells, by that time we had already decided obesity was an eating disorder caused by taking in too many calories. And nobody cared what the endocrinologists were learning about this obesity. I was actually, I was doing a BBC TV show. They were interviewing me in, in, in Oakland via Skype, and the host of the BBC show was a geneticist who studies obesity at Cambridge University. So he studies the genetics of obesity, and he got a little angry at me because I kept asking him questions when he wanted to ask me questions. But one of the questions I asked him was, do you know what regulates fat accumulation in fat cells? And he said, well, we don't know that. And I said, no, you don't know that <laughs> because you study genetics. But if you pick up an endocrinology textbook or a biochemistry textbook, it'll tell you, and it's primarily the hormone insulin, and it'll tell you what enzymes insulin upregulates and downregulates that work to pull fat into fat cells. Anyway, so this whole story ties back to sugar. If obesity is a hormonal regulatory defect, and if it's more or less controlled, as the endocrinology textbooks and the biochemistry textbook will tell you, by this hormone insulin, then whatever works to elevate insulin in your bloodstream is going to make you accumulate excess fat. And it happens to be sugar. Again, that's targeted in this condition in insulin resistance. And if you're insulin resistant, your pancreas has to pump out more insulin to make you accumulate fat, to make, to make you, excuse me, um, take up the high blood sugar in your body and deal with it. And so you've got a, basically a very strong chain of effects that would implicate whatever the cause of insulin resistance is in, in obesity, and if obesity, then diabetes, and if obesity, and diabetes. So again, that's the story I'm telling, and I think it's vitally important in doing it to understand the history. So much of this book is about the history. The other thing, I'm also saying that in 2017, we've missed the story. 2016, this came out December 27th. So I'm making this argument that the nutrition community got it wrong, the obesity community got it wrong, despite the anti-sugar movement. The question is, why is this anti-sugar movement about sugar being empty calories that we consume in excess, whatever that means, Nobody ever says lung cancer is caused by smoking in excess, right? They say it's caused by smoking, but we'll blame obesity on consuming foods in excess. And the question is, is it just caused by consuming foods? Just as smoking is caused by lung, you know, lung cancer is caused by smoking. So what I had to do with this book is I had to explain why such a profoundly important hypothesis had been ignored. And something I argue time and again is the evidence is actually ambiguous. I'm speculating by saying sugar causes all these disease. Why is it in 2017 I have to speculate we haven't done the research necessary to nail it down? So the other part of the story is how the sugar industry worked in the 50s, 60s, and 70s to take what the nutritionists were giving them and make sure no one ever concluded that sugar was uniquely toxic not a short-term toxin like we're used to, like a, you know, a chemical that might kill you if you inhale it for three weeks, but a long-term toxin that works over years and decades to create these chronic decisions, diseases, disorders that are so burdensome and will eventually shorten your life like no other. So much of what I do in this book is also talk about the history of the sugar industry, their public relations campaigns. They ran concerted campaigns in the 60s and 70s, first to uh, fight back the challenge that artificial sweeteners presented in the 60s. Um, and it's funny, people like to say it was a surreptitious campaign by the sugar industry, but I first realized this happened because I was reading a New York Times article. And an administrator, in 1967, a vice president of the Sugar Association took credit for spending almost a million dollars to fund studies to demonstrate that cyclamates were carcinogenic. And to a New York Times reporter, he says, look, if some competitor can outspend, can undersell you 10 cents to a dollar, wouldn't you throw a brickbat at him if you could? <laughs> 
So it wasn't a surreptitious campaign, it was just capitalism at its best. They were being, artificial sweeteners came on the market in the 1950s, by the 1960s they were taking over the, the soda industry and the sugar industry thought they had to fight it back. So they did, they funded studies and they got cyclamates banned and they almost got saccharin banned based on science that was almost unbelievably bad. Um, in the 1970s, when a very uh, influential British nutritionist named John Yudkin was claiming that sugar was deadly and that it was probably the cause of uh, diabetes and heart disease, the sugar industry funded a campaign of researchers who believed that saturated fat was a problem. And they just had the, the, the whole country, the nutritionists and cardiologists in the United States had concluded that saturated fat was what caused heart disease. And if it's what caused heart disease, it probably caused diabetes. So all they had to do was pay the nutritionists to st stand up and write what they really believed. And what they believed was that sugar was benign. And this report that was produced by the sugar industry, it had been designed part of a public relations campaign by a hotshot public relations firm in Chicago. And the report was called Sugar in the Diet of Man. It was about, uh, I think, 10 or 11 articles, a supplement in a journal, and they gave it to the FDA when the FDA had to decide whether or not sugar was safe or not. And the FDA read the report and said, clearly these very influential nutritionists believe sugar is benign, so we will too. And one thing led to another. And the end result was that roughly they managed to, in effect, shut down sugar research in this country for about 30 years. In fact, by the mid-1980s, to say sugar might be harmful and to study it was to be accused of being a quack. So it wasn't just that the NIH wouldn't fund such studies, but it would actually ruin your reputation as a scientist if you claim to do it. And what happened is some research was done anyway. For instance, there's a, one of the paradigm shifts I talk about in all my books is in the 1960s, we focused on the idea that we get heart disease because fat raises the cholesterol in our blood and our arteries clog up. We often use this sort of clogged pipe and some people actually talk about artery clogging fats. Anyway, this was the dogma and the problem, and this was embraced by beginning with a Senate committee run by George McGovern in 1977 that wanted to get in the business of telling Americans how to get healthy and then the USDA got involved, and then we had the dietary guidelines, and by 1984, the National Institutes of Health got involved, and they created the National Cholesterol Education Program, and then there was a report from the National Academy of Sciences, and it was followed by a report from, I'm gonna forget, Surgeon General's office. All of them saying, Dietary fat. The Surgeon General said that two-thirds of the deaths in America every year are caused by the fat content of our diet, and the evidence for it is stronger than it is for cigarettes and lung cancer, which was an insane statement. Because the evidence was virtually, is, I couldn't say non-existent, but completely uncompelling if you actually read the studies. So we had this idea that dietary fat causes raises your cholesterol and that causes heart disease. But while we were proclaiming this idea and we were putting it forth and changing our dietary policies and creating this dogma and the belief that a low-fat diet's a healthy diet, the research continues. This is what science does. So researchers started saying, look, this insulin resistance thing, this begins in the 1950s also seems to be crucial to heart disease. And there's a whole slew of metabolic disorders, things that start to go wrong when you get heart disease that cluster together. So it's not just high cholesterol, it's not clogging of your pipes. Your blood pressure goes up. Your LDL cholesterol may or may not go up, but your HDL cholesterol comes down. Something called triglycerides, blood fats, they go up. You start to become what's called glucose intolerant, which is, the beginnings of diabetes is visible. Your waist size gets bigger, you're getting fatter, and your inflammatory molecules begin appearing. You begin to develop a state of inflammation. So there's like a dozen or two dozen phenomena you could identify that shows that this whole homeostatic disruption is going on that culminates with heart disease or diabetes or cancer, and it's all fundamentally linked to insulin resistance. So today, 75, the CDC says 75 million Americans have this condition called metabolic syndrome, which is, for all intents and purposes, insulin resistance syndrome. And this is what's going to give them obesity and diabetes. 
if they get it, when they get it. It's a step on the way to obesity. It's a step on the way to diabetes. It's a step on the way to heart disease and cancer and Alzheimer's. And it's all linked to the carbohydrate content of the diet and specifically sugars. And we ignored it because we were so focused on cholesterol. That's the message we wanted people to get. And the drug companies have drugs that help prevent heart disease, at least in some patients, statins. And the statins lower cholesterol. So the drug companies wanted to reinforce this message because they wanted people to buy their drugs. I mean, it's again, capitalism at its best. But the real science, which was very powerful and very compelling, which all implicates sugar and carbohydrates, not fats, was ignored. And so what I've been trying to do as a journalist, and there are other there are researchers out there and other journalists out there, and we're all fighting this issue of we look like quacks. But we're making progress. And what we're trying to convince people is that they shouldn't be avoiding the fat and the diet, they should be avoiding the carbohydrates, they should be avoiding the sugars. And we're trying to convince people that they don't get fat because they eat too much. I mean, think about it this way. If I was giving a talk on wealth, I might get a pretty good audience. And afterwards, in the Q&A, somebody said to me, why is Bill Gates so rich, or Jeff Bezos? And I said, well, it's because he makes more, they make more money than they spend. <laughs> you guys would leave, right? If I was giving a talk on climate change, which would probably get a pretty full house, and at the end somebody says, oh, Gary, why is the atmosphere heating up? And I said, because it's taking in more energy than it expends. And I looked at you like this was a serious answer. You'd think I was joking. But in obesity research, when somebody asks why you get fat or why he's fat or she's fat and I'm not, the answer is they take in more calories than they expend. And it's almost incomprehensibly naive. And it's so much the conventional wisdom. You show me a paper on obesity, I'll show you where that belief system is interwoven into the research and into that paper. My geneticist friend at Cambridge University, the BBC host, he's not studying the genetics of why people get fat, he's studying the genetics of, he thinks, why people eat too much or exercise too little. So part of this goal is to get people to get rid of that energy balance idea. And the stakes are enormous, okay? As I said, one of the things, the fundamental thing I'm trying to do with this book, so Claude Bernard, the great French physiologist in 1865 said, science is about explaining what we observe, okay? Fundamentally, that's what you're always doing in science, whether what you observe is a supernova or a gamma ray burst in the, you know, from the night sky, whether it's uh, the way a frog behaves or a, you know, swallow's mate or you name it, anything. You know, why we get heart disease, why we get obesity, it's about explaining what we observe. The observation today that's so frightening is these obesity and diabetes epidemics worldwide. Every single population in the world, when they transition to a Western diet, from whatever they were eating baseline, so it doesn't matter whether they were Inuits living on caribou and seal meat or Maasai in Africa living on the meat and milk and urine from the cattle they herd or agrarian populations in the Himalayas or Native Americans or African Americans, any population when they start eating Western diets experiences these tremendous increases in obesity and diabetes. In October, the Director General of the World Health Organization, Margaret Chan, gave a keynote address to the annual meeting of the National Academy of Sciences. And she said these epidemics of obesity and diabetes represent a slow motion disaster worldwide. They're overwhelming healthcare systems. The estimated cost of obesity and diabetes in direct healthcare costs in the US is a billion dollars a day. If you look at indirect societal costs and you believe these estimates, it's a trillion dollars a year. And Margaret Chan said the chances of public health organizations like the WHO reining these epidemics in, she said preventing a, quote, bad situation from getting much worse is effectively zero. 
So think about that. The Director General of the World Health Organization is talking about these slow motion disaster epidemics and not only acknowledging that organizations like ourselves have completely failed to curb them, but predicting complete failure in the future. And one of the things I would do if I was a journalist or in newspapers, I would have, I mean, imagine if this was HIV. In 1985, we understood that the HIV virus causes AIDS, but imagine after coming to that conclusion, 40 years later, 30 years later, AIDS prevalence, AIDS incidence had continued to go up, mortality from this disease had continued to go up. We would have task force and committees and think tanks and teams of researchers. We would be spending billions, if not trillions, of dollars trying to understand what we don't understand about the disease. But in obesity and diabetes, we've had the same phenomena. You know, in the 1890s, the estimate was that roughly one out of every 3,000 patients in hospitals in the eastern coast, in Philadelphia and Boston and London and Paris, suffered from diabetes. It's one out of every 3,000. Today, if you go to VA hospitals, one out of four. Okay? One out of every 11 Americans in or out of hospitals has diabetes today. So there's been this tremendous explosion and we have to understand what's causing it. You cannot stop a di an epidemic unless you understand the cause. You have to know what to remove, what to get out of the population, whether it's the HIV virus, so you recommend you know, safe sex and contraceptives, and you design drugs that, are made, that go after the virus. If it's a lung cancer epidemic, you have to know it's smoking, right? So you can tell people to stop smoking. In this country, with obesity and diabetes, we have the Director General of the WHO basically shrugging her shoulders and saying, yes, we've seen 900% increases in diabetes in the United States in 50 years, 900%, and it's going to go up. But we don't know what to do about it. Well, how about examine your assumptions? So what I'm trying to do in this book is ask the question, are we wrong about what the cause is? If this was a legal case, and we have this crime being committed every country in the world, it's a very similar crime in a very similar way, who's the prime suspect? You know? Who should we be targeting? Why should we be targeting? And the answer is sugar. So with that long introduction, I'm going to do a little bit of reading, and I'm going to hope for the best. Okay, so the first chapter of this book, discusses this obesity and diabetes epidemics and why I'm focusing on sugar and why I think it's the prime suspect. As I say in the book, if this were a legal case, this book would be the prosecution strategy. Um, I had trouble writing it. I don't like writing. One of the reasons I'm such a good reporter, if I am a good reporter, is because reporting is a way to procrastinate on writing. <laughs> as long as you keep doing the research, you know, and then, like I said, the problem with that is eventually you run out of money, and then you have to write. Um, I had finally written the first chapter, and then I wrote the second chapter, Drug or Food, which I'm going to read from. And I finally had the sense of profound relief. This is a good chapter. I'm on my way. I'm going to be able to get this book done. And then I'm reading a book called 1493. So I spend 4,000 words, I have 4,000 words basically discussing this question of whether sugar is a drug or a food, is it addictive. 1493 is written by a friend of mine, Charles Mann. It's about the history of what's called the Columbus Exchange, which is the spread of foods and, and plants around the world after Columbus discovered America. And Charles, he goes by Cam, is such a beautiful writer that I can't even read his writing. It depresses me so much. <laughs> But I realized he had a chapter on the history of sugar. I should read it because I know he's such a great reporter and a great writer. And I'm reading his history. And in this chapter, he has a single line, 17 words. He says, scientists today debate amongst themselves whether sugar is an addictive substance or people just act like it is. And I think, <laughs> great, I've written 4,000 words. Cam's just wrapped it up in 17. I could throw away my first chapter, and then I'm back to the 
state of frozen, you know, writer's block that I was in, or I could keep the first chapter and quote Cam, <laughs> which is what I do. So you're going to find Cam's quote in here. It begins with two other quotes, two epigraphs. The first is from Roald Dahl, his memoir, Boys, Tales of Childhood, which was written in 1984. And Dahl said, the sweet shop in Landaff in the year of 1923 was the very center of our lives. To us, it was, what, it was what a bar is to a drunk or a church is to a bishop. Without it, there would have been little to live for. Sweets were our lifeblood. And then the second quote is from Michael Pollan, Botany of Desire, 2001, one of the great books Michael wrote before Omnivore's Dilemma. He said, imagine a moment when the sensation of honey or sugar on the tongue was an astonishment, a kind of intoxication. The closest I've ever come to recovering such a sense of sweetness was secondhand, though it left a powerful impression on me even so. I'm thinking of my son's first experience of sugar, the icing on the cake at his first birthday. I have only the testimony of Isaac's face to go by that and his fierceness to repeat the experience. But it was plain that his first encounter with sugar had intoxicated him. It was in fact an ecstasy in the literal sense of that word. That is, he was beside himself with the pleasure of it. No longer here with me in space and time in quite the same way he had been just a moment before. Between bites, Isaac gazed up at me in amazement. He was on my lap and I was delivering the ambrosial forkfuls to his gaping mouth as if to exclaim, your world contains this. From this day forward, I shall dedicate my life to it. <laughs> By the way, you should argue the wisdom of starting a book with two authors who can write better than you can. <laughs> your readers are likely to put your book down and go, I think I'm gonna go get Botany of Desire. Okay, what if Roald Dahl and Michael Pollan are right, that the taste of sugar on the tongue can be a kind of intoxication? Doesn't it suggest the possibility that sugar itself is an intoxicant, a drug? Imagine a drug that can do this to us, that can infuse us with energy and can do so when taken by mouth. It doesn't have to be injected, smoked, or snorted for us to experience its sublime and soothing effects. Imagine that it mixes well with virtually every food, and particularly liquids, and that when it, given to infants, it provokes a feeling of pleasure so profound and intense that its pursuit becomes a driving force throughout their lives. Overconsumption of this drug may have long-term side effects, but there are none in the short term. No staggering or dizziness, no slurring of speech, no passing out or drifting away, no heart palpitations or respiratory distress. When it is given to children, its effects may be only more extreme variations on the apparently natural emotional roller coaster of childhood. From the initial intoxication to the tantrums and whining of what may or may not be withdrawal a few hours later. More than anything, our imaginary drug makes children happy, at least for the period during which they're consuming it. It calms their distress, eases their pain, focuses their attention, and then leaves them excited and full of joy until the dose wears off. The only downside is that children will come to expect another dose, perhaps to demand it on a regular basis. I should have said this book was also informed by the fact that I am a parent of two pre-adolescent boys. Um, and uh, Michael Pollan, who said to me at lunch one day that m m moderating your children's sugar intake is one of the primary responsibilities of adulthood. And I borrow from Michael there as well, but I don't quote him. Um, how long would it be before parents took to using our imaginary drug to calm their children when necessary, to alleviate pain, to prevent outbursts of unhappiness, or to distract attention? And once the drug became identified with pleasure, how long before it was used to celebrate birthdays, a soccer game, good grades at school? How long before it became a way to communicate love and celebrate happiness? How long before no gathering of family and friends was complete without it? Before major holidays and celebrations were defined in part by the use of this drug to assure pleasure? How long would it be before the underprivileged of the world would happily spend what little money they had on this drug rather than on nutritious meals for their families? How long would it be before this drug, as the anthropologist Sidney W. Mintz said about sugar, demonstrated, quote, a near invulnerability in a moral attack, before even writing a book such as this one was perceived as a nutritional equivalent of stealing Christmas? I wanted to call this book Stealing Christmas, The Case Against Sugar, and just lay it out there, because I, I understand the Grinch-like aspect of what I'm doing. I mean, I'm not blind to it. 
Another way of saying I'm not an idiot. But my editor preferred. And a surprising number of people, when I told them the title, didn't get the Grinch reference. So I don't know, maybe Dr. Seuss isn't quite as uh, permeated our lives as I thought. Okay. What is it about the experience of consuming sugar and sweets, particularly during childhood, that invokes so readily the comparison to a drug? I have children, still relatively young, and I believe raising them would be a far easier job if sugar and sweets were not an option. If managing their sugar consumption, as Michael Pollan said, but I'm not quoting here, did not seem to be a constant theme in our parental responsibilities. Even those who vigorously defend the place of sugar and sweets in modern diets, quote, an innocent moment of pleasure, a bomb amid the stress of life, unquote, as the British journalist Tim Richardson has written, acknowledge that this dose does not include allowing children, quote, to eat as many sweets as they want at any time, and that, quote, most parents will want to ration their children sweets, unquote. But why is it necessary? Children crave many things, Pokemon cards, Star Wars paraphernalia, Dora the Explorer backpacks, and many foods taste good to them. What is it about sweets that makes them so uniquely in need of rationing? Which is another way of asking whether the comparison to drugs of abuse is a valid one. This is of more than academic interest because the response of entire populations to sugar has been effectively identical to that of children. Once populations are exposed, they consume as much sugar as they can easily procure, although there may be natural limits set by culture and current attitudes about food. The primary barrier to more consumption, up to the point where populations become obese and diabetic, and then perhaps beyond, has tended to be availability and price. This includes, in one study, sugar-intolerant Canadian Inuit who lack the enzyme necessary to digest the fructose component of sugar, and yet continued to consume sugary beverages and candy despite, quote, the abdominal distress that it brought them. As the price of a pound of sugar has dropped over the centuries, from the equivalent of 360 eggs in the 13th century to two in the early decades of this one, the amount of sugar consumed has steadily, inexorably climbed. In 1934, while sales of candy continued to increase during the Great Depression, the New York Times commented, Quote, the depression proved that people wanted candy and that as long as they had any money at all, they would buy it. During those brief periods of time during which sugar production surpassed our ability to consume it, the sugar industry and purveyors of sugar-rich products have worked diligently to increase demand and at least until recently have succeeded. The critical question with scientists debate, as the journalist and historian Charles C. Mann has elegantly put it, is whether sugar is actually an addictive substance or if people just act like it is. The question is not easy to answer. Certainly people in populations have acted as though sugar is addictive, but science provides no definitive evidence. Until recently, nutritionists studying sugar did so from the natural perspective of viewing sugar as a nutrient, a carbohydrate, and nothing more. They occasionally argued about whether or not it might play a role in diabetes or heart disease, but not about whether it triggered a response in the brain or body that made us want to consume it in excess. That was not their area of interest. The few neurologists and psychologists interested in probing the sweet tooth phenomena or why we might need to ration our sugar consumption so as not to eat it to excess did so typically from the perspective of how these sugars compared with other drugs of abuse in which the mechanism of addiction is now relatively well understood. Lately, this comparison has received more attention as the public health community has looked to ration our sugar consumption as a pop population and has thus considered the possibility that one way to regulate these sugars, as with cigarettes, is to establish that they are indeed addictive. These sugars are very likely unique in that they are both a nutrient and a psychoactive substance with some addictive characteristics. Historians have often considered the sugar as a drug metaphor to be an apt one. Quote, that sugars, particularly highly refined sucrose, produce peculiar physiological effects is well known, wrote the late Sidney Mintz, whose 1985 book, Sweetness and Power, is one of two seminal English language histories of sugar on which other more recent writers on the subject, myself included, heavily rely. But these effects are neither as visible nor as long-lasting as those of alcohol or caffeinated beverages, quote, the first use of which can trigger rapid changes in respiration, heartbeat, skin color, and so on, Mintz has argued that a primary reason that through the centuries sugar has escaped religious-based criticism, the kind pronounced on tea, coffee, rum, and even chocolate, is that whatever conspicuous behavioral changes may occur when infants consume sugar, 
It did not cause the kind of flushing, staggering, dizziness, euphoria, changes in the pitch of the voice, slurring of speech, visibly intensified physical activity, or any of the other cues associated with the ingestion of these other drugs. As this book will argue, sugar appears to be a substance that causes pleasure with a price that is difficult to discern immediately and paid in full only years or decades later. With no visible, directly noticeable consequences, as Min says, questions of, quote, long-term nutritive or medical consequences went unasked and unanswered. Most of us today will never know if we suffer even subtle withdrawal symptoms from sugar because we'll never go long enough without sugar to find out. Mints and other sugar historians consider the drug comparison to be so fitting in part because sugar is one of a handful of, quote, drug foods, to use Mintz's term, that came out of the tropics on which European empires were built from the 16th century onward, the others being tea, coffee, chocolate, rum, and tobacco. Its history is intimately linked to that of these other drugs. Rum is distilled, of course, from sugar cane, whereas tea, coffee, and chocolate were not consumed with sweeteners in their regions of origin. Actually, when the conquistadors discovered the Aztecs um, eating chocolate in Mexico in their march and through the continent and their devastation of the people, they, the Aztecs were mixing it with um, chili peppers, and the conquistadors tried it, and they said it, quote, it tasted awful, and they wouldn't feed it to their pigs. Um, so they shipped it back to Europe anyway, and it started, we started mixing it with... Um, sugar in Europe and within about 50 years hot chocolate had become sort of the morning and afternoon topple for the Spanish aristocrats. Um, in the 17th century one sugar was added as a sweetener and prices allowed it the consumption of these substances in Europe exploded. Sugar was used to sweeten liquors and wine in Europe as early as the 14th century. Even cannabis preparations in India and opium based wines and syrups included sugar as a major ingredient. Cola nuts containing both caffeine and traces of a milder stimulant called theobromine became a product of universal consumption in the late 19th century, first as a coca-infused wine in France, and then as the original mixture of cocaine and caffeine of Coca-Cola, with sugar acid added to mask the bitterness of the other two substances. The removal of the cocaine in the first years of the 20th century seemed to have little influence on Coca-Cola's ability to become, as one journalist described it later, quote, the sublimated essence of all that America stands for, the single most widely distributed product on the planet, and the second most recognizable word on earth, OK, being the first. It's not a coincidence that John Pemberton, the inventor of Coca-Cola, had a morphine addiction that he'd acquired after being wounded in the Civil War. Coca-Cola was one of several patent medicines he invented to help wean him off the harder drug. Like Coca-Cola enables its partakers to undergo long fast and fatigue, read one article in 1884. Two drugs so closely related in their physiological properties cannot fail to command early universal attention. As for tobacco, sugar was and still is a critical ingredient in the American blended tobacco cigarette, the first of which was Camel, introduced by R.J. Reynolds in 1913. It's this, quote, marriage of tobacco and sugar, unquote, as a sugar industry report described it in 1950, that makes for the mild experience of smoking cigarettes as compared with cigars, and perhaps more important, makes it possible for most of us to inhale cigarette smoke and draw it deep into our lungs. It's the inhalability of American blended cigarettes that made them so powerfully addictive, as well as so potently carcinogenic, and that drove the explosion in cigarette smoking in the US and Europe in the first half of the 20th century, then the rest of the world shortly thereafter, and of course the lung cancer epidemics that have accompanied it. An interesting story, when I, about 15 years ago, I read a book called Sugar Blues. Do any of you guys remember that? William Dufty, Gloria Swanson's husband, wrote this book, and in the book he talks about sugar and tobacco and how the sugar in the tobacco leaf is critical to the success of the American cigarette. And for years after that, I tried to confirm that story, and I just couldn't find any evidence to do it. And two things happened. The internet grew and grew, and more and more sources of evidence got scanned into the computer, and you could search them. And I also, back in about 2011, I was lecturing in Denver. 
at a bookstore, a tattered cover in Denver, and after my lecture, a woman came up to me and she said she was a dentist. I had gotten a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to write this book on sugar, and part of the grant was to uncover what I considered sugar, was sure was sugar industry uh, influence on the science in the 70s. You could feel it in the research the same way, you know, they discover planets by seeing the influence of, on other planets. So I'm giving this lecture. I had done nothing on the book. I had completely stalled. I was starting my not-for-profit instead. And after the lecture, this woman comes up to me, Kristen Kearns, and she says she's a dentist in Denver. She works in a lower-class uh, clinic, and she deals with diabetics with terrible teeth all day long. And she read my book, Good Calories, Bad Calories, and she became obsessed with it. And then she went to a lecture on, uh, the, you know, a, a, dentistry and chronic diseases, and she heard a speaker from the American Diabetes Association say they didn't know why diabetics had such poor teeth. And she was horrified, and she started investigating the sugar industry, and she used Google, and she found a catch of sugar industry documents that was uh, from a defunct sugar industry, um, that a, a company that had gone out of business and donated its archives to Colorado State University, and she drove up from Den Denver to Fort Collins. And she started pulling boxes, and the first box was labeled confidential sugar industry documents, and she thought she... So she tells me the story after my talk, and my eyes light up like the big bad wolf. I scared the hell. It's like, I want everything you've got, and I want to put it in my book and take credit for it. <laughs> um, I learned that Kristen's sense of humor was different than mine, so I had a... Anyway, we ended up working together. We did a... Our cover story for Mother Jones that helped Kristen get a job at UCSF as a researcher. Um, if you read the New York Times, you know she's had a couple of uh, front page New York Times stories based on her research. And um, I talk about her research in the book, and I'm proud to have played a role in her life, although I still regret having scared her so much that first day. Um, one of the documents that Kristen found is this document written by a sh sugar industry executive in 1954 called The Marriage of Sugar and Tobacco. So post-World War II, the sugar industry, all of America starts going on a diet, in part because artificial sweeteners are suddenly available to allow people to cut calories, and people are arguing that sugar is fattening, and the sugar industry sees the writing on the wall even then. And they realize they have to start diversifying their products. So they have to find other products that they could be using. And they're proud of the fact, in 1954, that sugar has played such a major role in the tobacco industry. And they're bragging about it in this document. And they had no reason to think that it wasn't a great thing. It was more American capitalism at work. And so it's all laid out in this document, including the references to FDA reports and the, the name of, you know, tobacco company executives who could confirm it. And it didn't really fit in my book, because my book's about heart disease and diabetes, not the role of sh sugar and tobacco, but how could I leave it out? So at one point I had a chapter called The Marriage of Sugar and Tobacco that I'd given number, it was chapter two and a half. You know, like the, if any of you saw Being John Malkovich, there was... Um, it ended up chapter three. My editor doesn't have the same sense of humor I do, either. But um, the other interesting thing is it actually had been covered. There's a brilliant historian of science at Stanford, Robert Proctor, who'd written a 700-page exposé of the sugar industry called Golden Holocaust, that is relentlessly reported, all based on the tobacco industry documents. And he came upon this article in the tobacco industry documents. So it doesn't really fit into his book. But he wrote about it anyway, probably because it's such an amazing story about the role of sugar in tobacco. And I was still able to kind of get the scoop in this book, because first of all, Robert Proctor's book is 700 pages long. <laughs> So it's hard to get through. Um, I find myself saying of other people's books what other people said of good calories, bad calories. It's good, but it's long. Anyway, a little bit more reading, then we'll go to Q&As. Unlike alcohol, which was the only commonly available psychoactive substance in the old world until sugar, nicotine, and caffeine arrived on the scene, the latter three had at least some stimulating properties, 
and so offered a very different experience, one that was more conducive to the labor of everyday life. These were, quote, the 18th century equivalent of uppers, writes the Scottish historian Neil Ferguson. Taken together, the new drugs gave English society an almighty hit. The empire, it might be said, was built on a huge sugar, caffeine, and nicotine rush, a rush nearly everyone could experience. Sugar, more than anything, seems to have made life worth living, as it still does, for so many, particularly those whose lives are absent the kind of pleasures that relative wealth and daily hours of leisure might otherwise provide. As early as the 12th century, one contemporary chronicler of the Crusades, Albert of Aachen, was describing merely the opportunity to sample the sugar from the cane that the Crusaders found growing in the fields of what are now Israel and Lebanon, as in and of itself, quote, some compensation for the suffering they had endured. The pilgrims, he wrote, could not get enough of its sweetness. As sugar, tea, and coffee instigated the transformation of daily life in Europe and the Americans in the 17th and 18th centuries, they became the indulgence that the laboring classes could afford. By the 1870s, they had come to be considered necessities of life. During periods of economic hardship, as a British physician and researcher Edward Smith observed at the time, the British poor would sacrifice the nutritious items of their diet before they'd cut back on the sugar they consumed. Quote, in nutritional terms, suggested three British researchers in 1970 in an analysis of the results of Smith's survey, it would have been better if some of the money spent on sugar had been diverted to buy bread and potatoes, since this would have given them very many more calories for the same money, as well as providing some protein, vitamins, and minerals which sugar lacks entirely. In fact, however we find that a taste for the sweetness of sugar tends to become fixed, the choice to eat almost as much sugar as they used to do, while substantially reducing the amount of meat, reinforces our belief that people develop a liking for sugar that becomes difficult to resist or overcome. Sugar was an ideal substance, says Mintz. It served to make a busy life seem less so, and the pause that refreshes, it eased or seemed to ease the changes back and forth from work to rest. It provided swifter sensations of fullness or satisfaction than complex carbohydrates did, it combined easily with many other foods, and some of which was also used, tea and biscuit, coffee and bun, chocolate and jam smeared bread. No wonder the rich and powerful liked it so much, and no wonder the poor learned to love it. What Oscar Wilde wrote about cigarettes in 1891 when that indulgence was about to explode in popularity and availability might also be said about sugar. It is, quote, the perfect pleasure. It is exquisite and it leaves one unsatisfied. What more can one want? Okay, thank you. I think I'll leave it at that and maybe... Thank you. We have about 10 or 15 minutes for questions. If you do have a question, please come to one of these mics. Remember to keep your question in the form of a question and keep it to one so we can get through as many as possible. Thank you. Okay. That's, um, I don't want to steal my own book. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I understand the case against sugar. Is there a case against artificial sweeteners that is, um, uh, do they have a bad rap just because big sugar was on their case? If we had, if we completely replaced sugar with artificial sweeteners, would we be healthy or would we, we not be healthy? Okay, well that's the question. If we replace sugar with artificial sweeteners, will we be healthier? So, again, 1999, American, the food industry was making available 155 pounds of sugar to every man, woman, and child in the nation. And then you calculate how much artificial sweeteners, because they're much more intense. Um, so you have a smaller dose to get the same sweetness, and then you ask the question, which is worse? So when the FDA banned cyclamates in 1971, which was the first successful artificial sweetener, they did so based on this rule that if you could show that sugar caused cancer in one laboratory animal, one you had to ban it, as a, you had to declare it not generally recognized as safe, and there were some lousy studies showing that cyclamates could cause bladder cancer in some rats at enormous doses. Some funny lines about you'd have to basically drown the rat in diet Sprite in order to give it. <laughs> um, 
answer to that question is, I can't believe artificial sweeteners are worse. But the science doesn't exist to say for sure. So a lot of the research implicating artificial sweeteners comes from the science of epidemiology, observational studies. This was the field that I first started examining when I moved into public health. So in observational studies, you, the most famous is a nurse's health study at Harvard or the Framingham Heart Study. You follow a population of people, you find out what they eat, you give them surveys, you follow them for 20 or 30 years and you see what diseases they get and you try to correlate the diseases with whatever it is they ate and you come up with associations. And you've heard this phrase, association is not causality. So you can say that people who were healthier consumed less artificial sweeteners than people who didn't, and people who were leaner consumed less artificial sweeteners than people who were fatter. And the nutrition community, because they can't do any better, will say, well, this implies that artificial sweeteners makes people fatter. But the other likely scenario is people who have a tendency to gain weight are the ones who are going to try and avoid the calories and the sugars and the soda, and so are going to drink the diet sodas. So you don't know what the truth is. That, those kinds of studies are the basis of this idea that artificial sweeteners cause metabolic disease like obesity and diabetes. When you actually do laboratory studies on humans, the evidence is very ambiguous and the studies are lacking in rigor. And they're often done on lean, healthy students. So if you're in a university setting, you want to do a study, you get lean, healthy students, and they might be able to tolerate sugar and or artificial sweeteners when middle-aged people predisposed to get fat can't. So I think the artificial sweeteners got a bad rap in the 60s and 70s. They were tainted with this sense that they're carcinogenic. I think that taint has stayed with it ever since and people see them as a target. I find the science uncompelling but it does not mean that they don't cause harm. The flip side is that there's at least one study suggesting, I forget what sweetener it is, it might have been sucralose, influences our gut, bio, our gut biota, and I don't know if that's meaningful, but the researchers would like to think it is, and there's um, a lot of suggests, a lot of smoke, and I don't see any fire. But I think that artificial sweeteners are vitally important for a lot of people to get off sugar. It's just too much of a step to go cold turkey to drinking water. So I think they're valuable anyway and I think my guess is that it's worth making the transition. They're certainly not worse than sugar. And another thing to, that I think of when I do these studies is I can find epidemics of obesity and diabetes in the literature in which artificial sweeteners clearly played no role at all. So when researchers today suggest that the artificial sweeteners might cause obesity or diabetes, I say it kind of violates my sense of Occam's razor. Does that make sense? But again, one of the messages in this book is that in part because of the success of the sugar industry public relations campaigns in the 70s, the research that should have been done 30 and 40 years ago was never done. So we don't really know the truth. We know that they're not short-term toxins, which is what the FDA requires. We don't know that they're not long-term toxins. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, your quote by Oscar Wilde touches on what I'm about to ask about, but I'm wondering if you can shed some light on the phenomenon where a person can binge on sugar to the point of nausea and yet the brain says, give me more. <laughs> I suffer from it, if that helps. <laughs> um, and the answer is no. I mean, again, one of the things, I, because of this lacuna in the research, even in the US, there was one group studying the possibility that sugar's addiction at Princeton, and they weren't biochemists, and I don't think I like them, and their hearts were in the right place, but I don't think they did good science. There's research in rats, on sugar. Um, one thing I never put in my book, my book, The Good Calories, Bad Calories, is very dense, but there was a theory in um, the field of physiological psychology. So physiological psychology became neurobehavior 
research merged and they became genetic dominated. But in the 70s or 80s, from, it begins with sort of Claude Barnard and Pavlov and a researcher named Cannon at Harvard who coined the term homeostasis. And the idea was that our fundamental behaviors are caused by fundamental by physiological states. So you drink a beer, that's a behavior, but you drink the beer because you're thirsty, and the thirsty is a physiological state, and you're trying to replenish body fluids. And there's all kinds of experiments you could do in animals, like you could adren destroy the adrenal glands of a rat, and that rat now needs salt to survive. And without knowing it, it, without knowing it needs salt to survive, it will come to prefer the taste of salt water to fresh water and then it'll drink salt water in order to keep living. So this whole field of science was... In the 1980s, there was a theory in physiological psychology that the liver is basically the organ that senses hunger. Just like our eyes, we don't actually see with our eyes. Our eyes record photons coming in, and the picture that we see is put together in our brain. The idea is our liver it basically... Um, monitors all fuel availability in the country and all the, in the body and all the foods that we eat are that carbohydrates and fats and proteins are all being um, passing through the liver and so the idea was that somehow the liver determines fuel status in the United States in, in the human body and it inhibits hunger so like insects basically we would be hungry all the time our baseline behavior is eating but when the liver thinks we have enough fuel it inhibits that behavior and the theory that I found compelling, which is actually the theory of a man who's become a friend and colleague now that he's retired, is that the liver is monitoring the production of a molecule called ATP in liver cells. So ATP is the energy currency of our body. It's uh, adenine triphosphate, and it breaks down to ADP, so three phosphate molecules. One of them gets used, you produce energy, you end up with two phosphate molecules. So the idea was, when we're producing a lot of ATP, it means we have a lot of, in our liver, it means we have a lot of fuel available, and that signal is sent many ways, primarily up through the vagus nerve, and it inhibits eating behavior. When we consume sugar, the fructose molecule, because I'm trying to understand that phenomena, that you get hungrier when you start eating it. I mean, this is true to some extent. The French have a saying that the appetite begins with the meal. And if you think about it, you could do this as an experiment. Think about the number of times you sit down to a meal and you're not really hungry, and you start eating, and you actually get hungrier. As you, and that's what an appetizer is. It's a food that's supposed to increase your appetite. So with sugar in particular, it requires more ATP to metabolize it than is produced. So it creates a diminishing of ATP in liver cells. So you consume it, even though it's in theory fueling the liver, it's actually depleting liver cells of ATP. And if my friend's theory is correct, that could explain a scenario by which, as you start eating it, you suddenly crave more of it. And you never get satiated. But not all people experience that. But not all people experience. Well, that's one of the things... I mean, I go out with my wife. A lot of... So the things that inform my writing of the book, I have children. I have a problem controlling myself around sugar. I used to be a cigarette smoker, so I think I understand addiction on a very profound level. Um, my wife, we go to dinner, she orders dessert. I don't, because I'm being virtuous, I don't eat sugar, right? <laughs> she orders dessert, because she doesn't care about being virtuous, and she has <laughs> two bites, and she pushes it away, and she's done. I'm having this mental conversation with her dessert now, you know. <laughs> Go ahead, eat it, you know you want it. No, 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 You're, you don't eat sugar, it's bad for you. You're just going to crave it, because the more you eat, the more... Gonna... It goes back and forth. The longer it takes a waitress to clear her plate, the greater the chances come to 100% that first I'm going to have one bite, and then I'm going to just finish it, you know? Like, give me that. Um, I don't think anyone knows. I literally, and clearly we respond to sugar differently. You know? Blood brain barrier? Huh? Could it be that it doesn't pass the blood brain barrier somehow? That it's. It has to do with the blood brain barrier? I don't think so. But again, it's, I, think it's, I think it's a peripheral effect first. 
you know. But again, it's whatever's happening, it happens instantaneously. I had a colleague at my not-for-profit who described his, you know, the first taste of his daughter to an ice cream cone when she was six months old. And the, the effect is so instantaneous that it's hard to understand what signals are being sent so quickly, even when a child has never had it before. So, if, you know, the University of Washington is full of people who study food reward. I think they... Um, I think about their research, what they think about mine, but this is what people Thank are Thank you very yeah. much. Okay, um, sugar, I got that. Um, highly refined carbohydrates, which sort of turn into sugar fairly quickly, I get that. How about alcohol? Um, also metabolized by the liver, also converted into fat. Non-alcoholic fatty liver disease um, is an interesting phenomenon because 20 years ago, if you were diagnosed with fatty liver disease, your doctor would assume, even if you told him you were a, you know, a rabbi and had never had alcohol in your life, your doctor would assume you were lying because clearly it's caused by alcohol. Then what happened is it starts showing up in children and it becomes clear that this disease is not always caused by alcohol. And, uh, you know, Robert Lustig, who's the uh, pediatric endocrinologist at UC San Francisco, who's sort of the most prominent proponent of the idea that sugar is toxic, the argument that I've been making, um, would say that they're metabolized the same way, effectively the same way. Biochemists, who I know, take issue with that. Um, so, un uncertain as far as you're concerned. What's that? Uncertain as far as you're concerned. If it's metabolized the same way. And I, for some reason. <clears throat> as far as you're concerned, whether, whether or not it's metabolized the same way as sugar is not, is an open question. Yeah, it's still an open question. I mean, again, I could probably find biochemists who could tell me for sure, but I know biochemists who take issue with that. Um, you know, the other thing, is life is a bit tedious, and we do need to enjoy ourselves. <laughs> You know, it's not just about living forever, it's about enjoying it on the way, so there's some balance. Um, two more questions? Yeah, one or two. Yeah. One on each. Yeah, thank you for what you do, even if uh, you did kind of ruin some of my pleasures, but um, <laughs> one thing I, I'm curious about in your research, did you, presumably, having sugar once a year is better than having it every day, which is worse than having it every month. Is, is, there, is there some, you know, <laughs> level at which I mean, clearly, you find it's not bad? It's, yeah, this is the thing, everyone's clearly different. So there's no way to say, I mean, I, as soon as I wrote my first op-ed sort of promoting my book for the Wall Street Journal, I got an email from a guy who said, his email address was silverfoxzzy at gmail.com or AOL, um, and he said, you know, I'm six years old, I'm an old fart, or 80 years old, I've been putting three teaspoons of sugar in my coffee every day for 60 years, I'm in perfect health, and your theory is full of... <laughs> um, clearly there are people who can tolerate it, for whom, you know, just like there's people who can, and this is where this, my smoking comes in, I mean, there are people who smoke two packs of cigarettes a day and never get lung cancer and live to be 100. So clearly they can tolerate the cigarettes that they smoke and there are people who can clearly consume enormous amounts of sugar and it might even make them more vigorous. But the question is, when you start with the population, so imagine you have a population, whichever it is, it's a traditional like Native American population in the Washington area 200 years ago and you give them sugar at 100 pounds a year and then the 200 years later, you've got some of them who are still very healthy and, uh, you know, it's a bell-shaped curve and a lot of them are obese and diabetic and it's the sugar. So, now how do you reverse it and what level is healthy? And the problem is I don't know. So, one way to, another way to think about it is clearly there's a level of smoking that people could do. Like, my wife could smoke two cigarettes a day just like she can eat, I mean, two cigarettes a month. We actually have a pack of Marlboro somewhere in the house that we hope our children never find because <laughs> her friends come over, she can have a cigarette. 
and smoke socially, and I can't. I have one cigarette. I'm going back to thinking about what I'm going to have the next and to take over my life. So again, it's sort of a decision we're going to have to make as adults, both how much we want to consume, considering the balance between pleasure and pain. If I consume any, it's easier for me to eat none than to try and eat it in moderation. I think there's a lot of people like me. Just as it's easier for me not to smoke cigarettes than to try to smoke them in moderation, it's easier for most alcoholics to not drink any alcohol than to try and drink in moderation. And other people can handle it. And there's, there's just no way to say. Any, uh, a related thing, any evidence that it's better if you're doing it, eating sugar as part of a meal with protein as opposed to by itself? Yeah, that probably. Matter? Again, I would say, I think I wonder in doing my research whether the real problem is sugary beverages because of the speed and the amount you consume. But again, there's, there's no way to really tell. Um, the, uh, I had a funny story and I forgot what it is. One more question. <laughs> Thank you, it was a wonderful speech. So you seem to place the blame on sugar, but isn't it true that it's overconsumption that is the problem, <laughs> which is the definition of gluttony? It's funny, I'm staying at the um, Clinton Alexis Hotel. There's a bookmark restaurant, delicious. And there, the elevator has a quote from Mark Twain. And actually I photographed it, so I'm gonna read it so I don't get it wrong. Hold on, I took a photo. My Apple product is failing me. <laughs> what a coincidence. He said, too much of anything is bad, but too much good whiskey is barely enough. <laughs> uh, so I, one of my problems with this whole thing is, as soon as you say excess sugar consumption, or excess calories, or excess fat, the word excess implies badness. It implies to... But what is the correct amount? This is the issue. It's sort of nobody says too many cigarettes cause lung cancer, even though clearly too many cigarettes cause lung cancer. We just say cigarettes cause lung cancer, and the cause of lung cancer is cigarettes. Cigarettes, so, not cigarettes. No, that's true. But my point is the word too much is a tautology. So there clearly is a place, like I said, remember I said Japan didn't have, in the 1960s, they had exceedingly low levels of obesity and diabetes, and they had the sugar consumption we had in the 1960s, uh, 1860s, which is about half of what we have today. So had we never gotten past, say, 40 pounds per capita in sugar availability, which who knows how much that made the industry makes available as consumed, but had we never gotten past that, we might still be a lean and healthy population. So that might be, you know, a sugary beverage once every other day or something, or a sweet is a treat, an ice cream is a treat, what it used to be before it became a common phenomenon. Then we, I think, I could imagine that all our population would be healthy and obesity and diabetes would be rare diseases, rare disorders, conditions, but, the point is, we've now gotten to where we are today, where 50% of the public is obese and or diabetic. So they might be healthier eating no sugar at all, not even fruits, which is a radical thing to say, but something I believe. So it's almost impossible. It's a, sort of the same question he was asking, how do we define too much? If the problem is caused by sugar, then it implies that there's a level in which it's so. Toxicologists say the dose makes the poison. So it implies that there's a dose that's safe, but we don't know what it is and we can be confident that it's different for different people. What I is trying to establish is that it's the sugar is the problem, not too many calories, not too much fat, not too much... But how do we define overconsumption? It's like if you're lean and your sister's fat, your sister is over-consuming. Yeah, I just have problems with the logic involved. And I can't, it draws me, my last chapter is called How Little is Still Too Much. And I talk about these, you know, logical loops we go in as soon as we try to define something like moderation or the flip side of moderation is overconsumption. It's so like Michael Pollan says, you know, famously, eat food, not too much, mostly plants. I think not too much is meaningless. 
Because there are people who weigh twice what you weigh and eat half what you eat. But they're by definition eating too much, right? Because they're fat. But we can say the same thing about alcohol. Or, you, know. you can, yeah. indeed. But we don't. We don't say too much drinking causes liver cancer. We say alcohol causes liver cancer. It's true that you have to, there's a point that it's safe and a point that it's not. But we don't say that. It's only when it comes to food and sugar that we start talking about overconsumption and too much. Otherwise, it's tautological. It, clearly, if something's bad for you, there's a level at which it becomes too much. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much.